So, um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Blum or Mark, or whatever. <laughs> <one. laughs> no, but just uh, briefly, uh, uh, we're so fortunate to have uh, right next door to us at UC Berkeley such an eminent uh, professor of Buddhism, uh, Dr. Mark Blum, and he's such a wonderful friend to BCA and IBS, and very gracious about uh, giving time to for us. So uh, the past uh, several MAP seminars, he and Raymond Matsumoto have been alternating doing lectures on the Tani show. Uh, just to give you an idea of kind of steady and scholasticism of uh, Dr. Guam, he's been translating the Nirvana Sutra, which should not show him quotes quite extensively. He's been working on this text for the past 30 years. And <laughs> How many more years to go to complete the... Uh, <laughs> no, that's not count. No. I'm, I'm viewed as a life insurance no. policy. <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, does a number of uh, uh, works for uh, Jodo Shu, as a uh, strong background in Jodo Shinshu, and of course the Buddhism in general. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brown. Uh, good morning. So just to add to that, just so you know where I'm coming from, uh, my PhD is from Ber Buddhist Studies program here in Berkeley, which is heavily philological, which means that it's based in reading texts in the original language. Uh, Berkeley is, we still are the only, and I'm teaching there, and we're the only Buddhist Studies PhD in America. You can get a PhD in the field of Buddhism in religious studies or in Chinese studies or something like that, but we're the only one that actually gives a Buddhist Studies PhD. And so I approach all of this from that perspective. Now, so then you want to know what the hell is Buddhist studies? And that's not so clear, actually. But even the field of religious studies is not so clear. So actually, Buddhist studies is older than religious studies, believe it or not. Uh, Buddhist studies is really invented in Oxford by Max Mueller in the 1860s, 1870s. You know, mm -hmm. there's a series of books you probably know about called Sacred Books of the East. Yeah. You know, that's really when all of that starts, and religious studies is actually invented after the war, in the 1950s, after pressure upon um, divinity schools in the major private universities in America, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, they all start off as divinity schools, as seminaries, right? And then there was a lot of pressure, why are you only teaching that kind of religion? And so they start small religion program. So the Divinity School may have 20 professors uh, teaching Bible and three professors teaching religion. That's how it starts, and in many places it's still like that. Duke is still like that. Um, and so that the non-Christian, non-Bible stuff, there's like one token Jewish person, one token Islam person, and one token <laughs> Buddhism person. Uh, and it's still Bible, Bible, Bible. So, But then it began to finally expand in the 60s and 70s into, really in the 70s, into an interesting field. But what religious studies is remains unclear. How do you teach religion? What do you talk about? You talk about um, social engagement. You talk about death. You talk about bioethics. Do you talk about, you know what I'm saying, politics. You talk about internal institutional structure. You, talk, you know, it's complicated. And um, so, um, anyway, Buddhist studies, on the other hand, at least in the traditional definition, which is very strong in Japan, very strong in Germany, and very strong in a few places in Europe, uh, a little bit in England, University of London, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and University of Paris, and a, a little bit in Copenhagen and Oslo, and that's it, is first of all, you look at the original material, you read it in the original language, and you study the language well enough to know the context of how this is put together, what the nuances and implications are of that language, those words used at that time. And after you figure that out, then you can talk about, well, what does this mean? How do we interpret it? Well, the religious studies tends to jump to the interpretation first and with limited language ability. And the, res the downside of that is you're relying on translation. Mm -hmm. And that is very, shall we say, precarious. Mm -hmm. Particularly in terms of a text like the Tangi Show, <laughs> <laughs> which the language is very fraught and um, and can be read in lots of different ways. So um, let me just add a little plug from my Tangi Show workshop. Yeah. Also, so um, I um, I 
I've been very interested in Tiny Show, like all of you are, and for a long time. And um, I was at Otani University. So yeah, let me before we start that, let me just tell you, I'm also a Higashi trained person, not a Nishi trained person. And so that's another funny story. If you haven't heard this, uh, for since the seven, well, since the seventies, yeah, I guess late seventies, there have been two American white scholars studying Jodo Shunju, James Dobbins and me. And James Dobbins was always at Ryukoku, the Nishi Honganji, and I was always at Otan, Higashi Honganji. And never the twain shall meet. <laughs> they never invited us to the other campus for 25 years. I'm telling you, it was really bizarre. And then I would see James at conferences and we'd have a drink and laugh about this. So in those days, sectarianism was very strong, very, very strong. And then about five or six years ago, it began to melt. And it began to melt, I think, probably because the population shrinkage in Japan finally started to impact the whole university system and society as a whole. Uh, and the same kind of thing that's also sort of promoted ecumenical thinking in the West, which is that people are, don't know what religion is anymore, they don't go to church anymore, and so we have to sort of get together with our comrades, whatever their religious orientation is, and just talk about the value of religion as a whole. So. Um, in 2000, thank you, in 2010 and 11, uh, great, I was in Kyoto on a Fulbright grant and Dobbins was invited to teach at Otani. And so we were both at Otani in the same place, in the same hallway, offices right next to each other. And um, so that was very fruitful. And at that time, for the first time, I was invited to Rikoku Daigaku to give a talk. And I gave a talk, uh, it was on sort of the, I don't know, the future or something about it. Uh, the future of Buddhism, Buddhist studies, or how to study Buddhism. And so that, of course I had two professors from Tokyo University, you know, famous school, and then little old me, the white guy. <laughs> and I talked about the internet, you know, which nobody had addressed at all. And I was on the front page of the Kyoto newspaper, you know, the next day for that. So, Suddenly, I was like on the map, you know. And now I'm like a regular person to Ryukoku. Uh, and they actually, they just printed out a little color pamphlet of their new Buddhist Cultural Studies Center. My picture's in there somewhere. So, <laughs> and Dobbins now is invited regularly to Old Tani as well. So things are much better than before, much more interesting. And um, so one of the things I discovered in that year that I was in Kyoto was that um, the Tani Show is, has a very interesting history, and I'm interested in the history of the text, and you probably know this, but the oldest extant copy is a handwritten manuscript copy by Renyo. Renyo adds a little footnote at the end, a little postscript. And, um, and the story has been, the story was at that time, that the text was a secret transmission. Renyo says, don't show it to people who are not ready, etc. And uh, it wasn't until Kiel's Manchi, the first president of Otani University, who said, let's make this public. And so he had a journal called Seishinkai, The World of the Mind, and he said, let's open this up, let's publish it in there. And then he dies at the young age of 42. They start to publish it serially, and thank you. And the response is overwhelming, because all the intellectuals in Japan, you know, writers like Natsume Soseki, these people, they're all reading that journal. It's, it's a really cutting edge um, thing. And, so in every issue of that journal, an artist has a different picture on the front. It's really quite, quite an, it's really, really like something in the, coming out of New York, you know. And so, um, so uh, that was the story. And then, it, then we had this play uh, called Shukke to Sono Deshi, The Priest and His Disciple, which is, uh, you know, I guess this is around 1920 or so. That play is so is based on the Tani Show. That play is so successful that that book is translated into English. Like before the Tani Show is translated, that play is translated. So anyway, um, that was the story. And I thought, well, that's really interesting, except when I go into the library, I see this book, this commentary on the Tani Show published in 1895 from Hozo Khan, this Buddhist publisher in Kyoto. So I said, that doesn't make any sense. You know, if Hozo Khan is publishing an Edo period commentary in 1895, five or six years before the Tani Show appears in this journal, there must be something else here. And so I asked and asked and finally, Professor Kaku, who teaches at Otani, who I knew was a graduate student, uh, said, oh, there's a whole new book on the Edo period commentaries on the Tanya, you should look at this thing. 
and he showed me the book and I said, wow. So I contacted the publisher, Hozo Khan again, and they said, oh, that book's out of print, but um, let's, we, we called the author and he invited you to come to his house and he'll give you one. So I went to his house, we spent four hours talking about the Tani Show, it was spectacular. And this guy, Nishida Shinin is his name, and he was not a professor, he's a Higashi person, but he's not a Otani person, he teaches at the seminary inside the Honzan, the Gakuryo. Okay? Oh. It's called the Takakura Gakuryo. Oh. So, so you should know that they're, just like a Ryukoku, they have a kind of um, sectarian study program for ministers, which is separate from what happens in the university, and the curricula is sometimes the same and sometimes not, right? So this guy Nishida um, spent the first hour complaining to me about the professors that I had at Otani teaching Shinshu, <laughs> how wrong they were. <laughs> but this poor guy, he's in this little seminary, so he gets no public recognition, right? He's not a professor at Otani. So uh, anyway, so he did this book on Edo period commentaries on a time show. It turns out, oh my god, there's huge, big, lively debate going on for 400 years, long before Kiyosawa Manchi, about how to read the Tani Show. And we have a commentary in 1662, which is quite detailed, okay. So, I said, holy shit. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Something that affected Japanese. And so, so, I, so since then, I've been kind of mulling over, uh, how can I some, start some kind of study project on this? Because there's nothing even in Japanese on this, except in this one book. And so, um, I held a seminar at Cal a couple of years ago, and it was hard to get students without the BCA participating. I wouldn't have had enough students to have the class, but Dake Sensei's son was here, and we managed to do it, and it was just fascinating. That's what we did. We read that first commentary. So, um, so a couple of years ago, I then decided, let's try to do a workshop with Ryukoku, Otani, and Berkeley. And so I negotiated and negotiated, it took a long time, but we've worked it out. So now we have a five-year project to read the pre-modern commentaries and translate the important parts of them. And we're also, part of the seminar also is to produce a new English translation based on those early commentaries to see how the text has been read over time. Mm -hmm. So you actually get to put the text into a historical context of how the Japanese Shinshu people understood it. Not how somebody today who wants you to believe in this reads it, right? Um, and also, part of, the, part of what we're doing in the seminar is also looking at 20th century Japanese readings of it. Because there's a debate in modern Japan as well about the Tani. So some people hate the text. Some, there are huge devotees of Shinran and Shinshu who do not like the Tani Show, who feel it does not represent him and it should not be studied. Um, and that's also fascinating. And um, there are people who totally are in love with it. You just open the page, they start crying, you know? So, so that's also part of it. And there's a lot of, it's really produced a huge interesting debate. And uh, most, again, in the West, there's nothing written about this at all. There isn't, not even, even any study of the Tani Show in English of any value at this point. Um, and one more thing to add to this is the, the Kyoto School of Philosophy, you guys have probably heard about this, maybe you, you read on this stuff, Nishida, Kitaro, Nishitani, Tanabe, uh, where these people um, are famous this, uh, for kind of mixing traditional European German philosophy and Buddhist philosophy, and they're um, the Zen part of what they do is well known, but in fact there's a whole Shinshu part of what they do, and a lot of the Shinshu part is based on the Tanji Show. So if you don't know how the Tanji Show was read in modern Japan, you can't understand that whole side of what they're doing. They're not reading the Kyogo Shinsho, just like almost nobody in Japan today reads the Kyogo Shinsho, because it's too hard. And the Tanji Show is written in beautiful Japanese, and the Kyogo Shinsho is written in sometimes very difficult Chinese. So unless you have good training in reading Buddhist Chinese, you don't, you know, you're going to have a hard time. So, so that's where we are for the seminar. The workshop, we had it twice last year. We're going to have it again uh, this early first weekend in March. You're all invited. It's open to the public. It's free. You have to be able to read classical Japanese, unfortunately. You're not going to get much out of it. But uh, turns out the commentaries, the language in the com Edo period commentaries are just not that difficult if, you, if you've had some classical Japanese and some knowledge of Buddhism. Um, 
Okay, I guess that's it. Oh yeah, one more thing. So this is also something I want to talk about today. Um, so in this session, we're supposed to do chapter 17 and 18, and I have to say, chapter 17 and 18 of the Tanisha are not that exciting. <laughs> Sorry, you all looked at that, you all realized that. So I got interested in something else. I was talking to Marvin about this yesterday, is this thing called Rondai. Okay. So, uh, so one of the strange things in this study of this tiny show that I'm pushing is that this Edo period, so Edo period, I'm talking 1660 mm -hmm. to the Meiji, to 1868, the Meiji period, right? This Edo period, there's about five major works on the tiny show that are well read and well studied. They're all Higashi Hongaji. There's nothing from the Nishi side at all. In fact, there's nothing in the Nishi side, even in the Meiji period, until you get to the very end of the Meiji period. One of the really bizarre things is that the first inklings of translations of the Tanisho come out the first times that he got Nishi scholars start writing about the Tanisho, even in Japanese. So there seems to be a rejection of it in the Edo period by the Nishi intellectual community, which seems very odd to us today because to, at this point everybody embraces the Tanisho and reads it and loves it. So, um, what is that all about? So, I was talking to Henry Adams about this, and Henry talked about something called Rondai. So, what are Rondai? For those of you who know, Kanji. These are like topics, okay? Rondai are, um, apparently this is a Nietzsche term also. So uh, what I was doing, the reason I was a little late today is because this, I found this text yesterday and spent the morning digitizing it, <laughs> uh, doing a scan, an OCR scan, so I could look up words in it. And I actually, um, so what Henry mentioned was that when he was studying at Ryukoku, um, they had uh, Shubutsu, right. Shubutsu, right. Shubutsu, yeah. So how do you, what does Shubutsu explain? That, that's, that's the seminary school for Nishino. Uh, <coughs> okay. So when he was at Shubutsu, he said there were 17 Rondai. And he said that he, his teachers told him recently, but just before that there had been 25. Okay, And before that there had been 100. So there's a strange thing that they're decreasing. Now what are Rondai? Rondai are suitable topics for Shinshu priests, ministers, all of you, to study, okay? This is, this is something that Higashi Sai doesn't do. So I'm interested in this because uh, this may be a clue to why, the, how they thought about the Tani show. Because, so, I discovered, or when Yokoyama discovered, that there's something in the Shinshu Zensho. Shinshu Zensho is a compilation of, Nishi, of, of Shinshu texts from put together by the Nietzsche scholars, excuse me, in the Tajil period, in the early 20th century, and 1920s, and there's a book in there called Shinshu uh, Hyakudai Keimo. You don't need to know that, but I'll give you that later if you want. So it's a hundred rondai, okay? Uh, the, in, uh, the opening up for the Enlightenment, Kemo is a word for Enlightenment in the sense of European Enlightenment. It's the same word. So it's the you know, Enlightenment discussion of the hundred topics, okay? Uh, hundred suitable topics. And so I spent the morning doing an OCR scan on this, and Tiny Show is not one of the topics. The Tiny Show appears as a word only five times in 300 pages of this text. And each time the Tanisho is mentioned, it's only mentioned as another source for the same point. The Tanisho and the Gaima Show and something else also say this. That's the only time the text is mentioned. It's clearly intentionally being ignored. Okay. It's stunning. It's really, really stunning, especially considering on the Higashi side, not only the debating how to read it, but the debating who the author was, where did it come from, you know. And considering the fact that Renyo really, really liked this text, and the Nishi Shai really likes Renyo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a strange contradiction, okay? So, um, you know, 
there are all sorts of sectarian polemics going on here that we don't have to get into, but I just wanted to mention this to you, but this is one of the, um, one of the enigmas surrounding this text. The Italian show is just a unique work of history. There's really nothing like this, certainly nothing like this in Japan. It's by far the best read book, religious book in Japan today, without question. Um, and the typical um, sort of doctrinaire, shall we say, party line reason why the Nishi people did not study it is because it was not written by Shinran. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you people all think about that. Mm -hmm. How significant is that to you? I'm curious. I want to get you your, your participation in this. Well, I guess one thing that comes to my mind immediately is that if you figure that text is associated with interpretations and ideas that you would care not to have part of your system, then that's an easy way to block it off. That's right. That's one way to dispose of it, right? Yeah. Okay. But separate from that point, you're just reading into it, and you're, you may be right there, but I just wonder, Considering the fact that so many Nishi people like the Tani Show today, that perspective that it has ideas that we don't want to talk about seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Um, so, and I also want to say also that, um, as I understand it, in America, we're not beholden to this tradition or that tradition the same way people are in Japan. We can sort of do what we want, and I hope you all agree with that. And therefore, if the Tani Show is interesting to you, it seems to me you should study it, you know, and talk about it. But in any case, but this question of uh, origin, provenance, is for many people very important. And um, I'm just curious to get your perspective on this. Do you think this matters or not? Or you're not quite, yeah. So I actually think that the, the lack of definitive origin on it makes it more interesting. Okay. In that I don't have to worry about it in such a black and white doctrinal manner. But rather, I can apply myself to my own interpretation of it. Oh, okay. Because if it's through, and I like. Sure, you could reject parts of it and take other parts. Exactly, of it. and yeah. so I mean, I think it's the same way. The Nishi approach to it may be a little more like how some biblical scholars look at the Bible versus other biblical scholars, okay. and the fact that it's <laughs> something written by man or something like, <laughs> like that whole concept here, because right. you get some of that from Nishi followers of the Kyoko Shinsho is this is doctrinal and this is the word and this is where the word ends. Right. And this allows us to be liberal with it. Because if if Yuenbo wrote it or if Shinran wrote the first ten chapters or if he said the first ten chapters, like or whoever. Whoever. The wisdom there is the same. But how do we interpret it? Okay. Like, so for you it's based on content. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, similar to that, uh, how can you be a school of Buddhism who uh, one of your three major sutras is dubious uh, in its origins? Um, well, can you go into that a little bit? Uh, uh, <laughs> dubious, that's a strong word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what in, dubious in, in what in sense? That, You're talking the, about the Contemplation the, Sutra? The, yeah, the Contemplation Sutra in that usually sutras are are expected to be that which is the word of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha Good. that has been passed down. Right. But with the Contemplation Sutra, yeah. um, what the hell is going on? Yeah, there, there was no <laughs> there was no preceding uh, Sanskrit text. The Sanskrit was actually, from my understanding, taken from the Chinese. There is no Sanskrit. Well, it was written after the fact yeah. by some to there's try no to Sanskrit, There's no Tibetan. There's only one is, Chinese translation. Usually when that's the case, the text is written in China. Yeah. Right. Even though there's a lot of Indian content in it, of course. I mean, how the Chinese know about Vaidehu? Who the hell is that? You know, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, so therefore, that's not a problem as far as you're concerned. So right. So, so how can you in one case, you know, say, of our sacred three texts, the scrolls of which sit on the uh, 19th. So then I would say to you, do you think in the Edo period, the Nishi scholars knew the Contemplation Sutra was written in China? We don't know that, right? We, we, we and is that a relevant sure. question? Be, right, we can't be sure at, at right. what point they figured that they, out. Yeah, okay. came to that understanding. All right, so you're just getting the contemporary perspective today. In other words, today, in terms of looking at it, Considering the, that sutra is clearly of dubious origin, 
then watch the Tana Show. My away. word, not yours. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like that word. Okay. Someone else? I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. Okay. I shared with the group earlier that my upbringing was um, as a fundamentalist Christian. And oh, if, you look at the, if you look at the Gospels, I mean, each of those is some of the interpretation of what Christ said. Not only that, but there are a lot of Gospels that aren't in the Bible. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So let me let me add to the the, the Pure Land Sutra bit to make this to reinforce your point about dubious origins. The larger sutra, the larger sutra has five different translations in Chinese, all of them different. The Sanskrit we have for that, there's three or four versions. The see through manuscripts of the Sanskrit is different from all the Chinese versions. So from a Buddha logic, you know, from my perspective as a Buddhist studies person, uh, what is the larger sutra? You know what I'm saying? Which one do you choose to be the authentic one? None of them are authentic because they're all a product of history. So maybe Shakyamuni said something like that, mm -hmm. but it clearly evolved over time. And whatever we have, you have to choose which one you like, which one you don't like. Right. And depending on which one you pick, you get a different number you of get vowels. A, you get not only, <laughs> not only that, but maybe it's 48 and maybe it's more or less. <laughs> well, not only that, some very, very important things change. Number one, in the early versions of the sutra, there are no women in the Pure Land. In the, in the later version, the one that everybody likes, that point is just pushed aside and not touched. Mm. Uh, in the earliest version of the sutra, Shakya, I mean, Amitabha dies in the Pure Land. Amitabha is not eternal. I mean, it's part of samsara. And he just has a long life, okay? And when he dies in the Pure Land, he's replaced by Kamno, okay? Who then dies also, okay? Mm. So it's a very different version, a very different concept of what the Pure Land is like, what it's about. There are arhats there, not just bodhisattvas. It's very close to other Pure Lands of other Buddhas, which are much more you know, open and inclusive, and not strictly Mahayana. So that's also, in other words, if you really push these things, if you really push the origins of sutras, all the Mahayana sutras are questionable, but the entire I mean, the New Testament is, to me, just absurd, you know, to think that that's really history, right? And, and in fact, you know, you have Gospels of Jesus in which there's no resurrection, right? Oh. And so, uh, why does there have to be a resurrection for them to read Christianity? So there are Catholic priests who are friends of mine who, who even publicly, but not too often, will say, we've got to get rid of the resurrection, we've got to get rid of the miracles, and talk about the wisdom. That's what the Bible should be about. But that's a radical thing to do, right? Gospel of Thomas, guess what? The Gospel of Thomas is one of Jesus' disciples. He goes to India, okay? He comes back. There's no resurrection in Thomas. It's very Buddhist, the kind of stuff that he talks about. He talks about thinking, you know? So, in other words, these things are always a product of history. And as they evolve, they change. And we um, have what happens to have been written down at some point, And then whoever the editors are at the time of the church who are in charge, they decide that's the one they like. They like these four Gospels of Jesus, they don't like the other ones, they're excluding them. And in the case of, it's very interesting, the case of Tibet, when the text was tra sutra was translated more than once, the Tibetans always chose one version. They said, we've got to make a choice, we're going to choose this one. But in China, they didn't do that. They said, let's take them all. And so what you end up with is this huge plethora of versions of the same text, which from the believer's perspective is not pleasant. <laughs> Clarify things, please. <laughs> so, if you look at, for example, how the, um, you know, I study the whole history of exegetical writing in Pure Land. Tan Luan, Dao Chuo, Shan Dao, so I mean, all these different people. And if you look at the way they refer to the Pure Land Sutras to justify their interpretation, they take from all of them. They take from all the translations of the larger sutra, not just the main one that everybody holds to be central. So they feel free also to pick and choose what works for them. So this idea that we can pick and choose today what works for us is the way it's always been, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but that means, therefore, <laughs> that just begs the question, again, why does the Nishi people in the Edo period not read the Tani Show when it seems to be such a powerful work? Okay. So I can't answer that. That's one of the enigmas we're working on, and, um, and well, I'll let you know in four more years that we get this kind of conclusion. But I think this Rondai business is part of the story. 
In other words, I think at some point in the Edo, at least the second half of the Edo period, they decided they were going to limit what was suitable for discussion in the seminaries. And they did have a kind of you know, political problem internally within uh, Nishi Hongan's the Sango Wakunan incident. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that led to this fear that we have to not, we have to limit things, otherwise we're going to get more, yeah. Based Trouble. on my peripheral reading of Japanese history, because I can't read Japanese, I think you're close to the real issue. Uh, you have to remember, the Edo period was essentially a police state, and these people always had to look over their shoulders. Uh, because especially after that incident, the whole organization was effectively put on notice that hey, you guys screw up one more time, and you're out of business. Yeah, I mean, the song of Akronan, you know, if you, just briefly, if you don't know about this, there was a big conflict between different teachers, sort of at, inside Kyoto in the capital, under the Hong, Honganji's control and the people in the provinces, and the conflict between their different views got to the point that actually were punching each other, and, and got physically dangerous, and the government had to step in, and there was actual a, a trial, a legal public trial, in which the government stepped in and gave sentences out to these people. That's really unheard of, you know. Uh, I don't know if that ever happened before in Japanese history. So, obviously that caused the leadership to be very circumspect. Now, I, I want to mention one more thing about the Meiji period. So, you know, uh, the Higashi side didn't have this problem. The Higashi side, again, seems to be more open and more, and they have their own, their own lively debates, but at least it didn't lead to fisticuffs, you know? <laughs> but when you get to the Meiji period, another interesting thing happens. And so if Nishi is very conservative at the end of the Edo period because of this political trouble internally, when the transition from the Shogun political system to the Meiji political system divides Nishi and Higashi also very significantly. So if you don't, most people don't know about this, but the, at the, you know, there was a civil war that went on for a couple of years at the end of the Edo period, and the two Honganjis took different sides in this fight. The Nishi side backed the young samurai that were overthrowing the Shogun, and they won. So when the Meiji government comes in, they're very tight with them, okay? Because the two Honganjis were wealthy, they contributed money and supplies to this effort, and so in the early Meiji period, you have very strong suppression of Buddhism by the these hyper-nationalist leaders of the country, but they don't touch the Nishihonganji temples. And not only that, but um, that only goes on for a couple years, and my understanding is that in fact, uh, the major government went bankrupt about three or four years into their rule, and they got a big loan from Nishihonganji. I don't know, and so the Higashi side, um, I'm not sure, this is sort of hidden stuff. So. Uh, I don't know if you guys, you also gave them a loan. But I do know this, that in that Civil War period in the 1860s, the Higashi side supported the Edo Bakufu, the Shogunate. And they lost. So when the new government came in, guess what they thought of Higashi Honganji? God damn, we're going to get those guys, right? <laughs> it's like Trump's enemies, you know? You supported the wrong person, so you're, you, they remember, you know? Because it was violent, right? So the Nishi side, therefore, became much, much closer to the new government in the Meiji period. And that's one reason why when the new government, when the Meiji government moves into this hyper-nationalist rhetoric, the Nishi's right lockstep with them, because they're with them from the beginning. In a sense, they're kind of part of the same movement, you know, they don't really have a choice. And whereas the Higashi side, uh, because they backed the wrong person in the Civil War, they, the wrong side of the Civil War, they're on the outs and they're suspect and therefore they're not as invested in the status quo, in the political status quo in society. That meant that the Higashi people are freer to do what they want because they don't have to, you know. So what I tell my students all the time is that uh, institutional religion has two completely opposite functions in society. This is true everywhere for all religions. One function is to support the status quo. That's why we have just war theory in Christianity. You have all sorts of things, you know, obvious examples of the way churches support what governments want to do. The other uh, role of religion is to um, promote individual religious inquiry, right? Spiritual inquiry, spiritual liberation. That tends to be anti-status quo. That tends to be disruptive, deconstructive, and dangerous, a threat to the status quo. So religion has both 
faces, which are in opposite purposes, right, going on simultaneously. When you see what happened in the Meiji period, you see the Nishi side is very much, for political reasons, gets tied to this conservative role, okay? And that makes it harder for them, again, to move outside their tradition and do new things. Whereas the Higashi side, because they're, um, they're already, you know, it appears, at least in terms of Tanisho scholarship, already doing a lot of interesting inquiry, even before the Meiji period. When they back the wrong side in the Civil War, they then are even further removed, and therefore they're further free to do what they want because they're sort of persona non grata. So guess who sent students to Max Mueller in England to study Buddhist studies? Higashi Honganji Otani, not Nishi. So the Higashi side is really, really progressive in this way. They go to Europe in a big way. Joroshu does also. Joroshu, guess what? That's the sect of the Tokugawa family, okay? So when they get overthrown, they're also out of power, but they still have a lot of money. They send scholars to Europe also. So the Jodoshu and the Higashi Honganji and the Meiji period are doing a lot of progressive stuff. Uh, the Nishi side, again, tends to hunker down and try to, you know, sort of be, do the right thing. So uh, that leads, to, I'm saying, that doesn't go on forever, but obviously those, those momentums, you might say, there's an inertia, a momentum there that's quite different, and I, I think that explains to some degree why we don't see Nishi scholarship on the Tani show. Because again, as I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to imply here is that the Tani show to me is a disruptive document. It's not a status quo affirmative document. I think because it's disruptive, uh, it's appealing to us, <laughs> appealing to a lot of people, but not appealing necessarily to uh, someone who thinks that religion's goal is to affirm status quo in society, keep women in the home, you know, this kind of thing. So, um, anyway, that's my historical spiel. Okay. So I asked um, Edith to blow this up, but this is in Japanese. So I don't know how many of you read Japanese, but you, she made copies for everybody, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, this is an article about Rondai, okay, or Anjin Rondai. Um, so, I don't know, we're not going to read this, I just want to let you know. So, at the end of the session, maybe you can come and get them. Okay, good. Alright, so let's, um, let's talk about chapter 17 and 18. We go to 1215, okay. Um, you are using different books. You have different Oh, just, yeah. just like last time. Oh, which, which one are you using? We'll just I, I, don't, I don't have any preference. I, oh. I like this one, Gordai Shigeru. You know, this is in Japanese, so I don't, oh. <laughs> I don't have a... Well, which English one? Because uh, we could... We should, talk. like, read them all. These, the 17 and 18 are short, so why don't we do that? Why don't we have... Uh, you have time in those? So why don't you read that first, and then we'll read from that one. Okay, and then we'll do maybe complete works or something. So do 17. Okay. 17. Some people say that those born in the borderland will eventually fall into hell. What a testing passage makes this claim. This is asserted by those who claim to be scholars and is truly deplorable. How are they reading the sutras, commentaries, and teachings? I have been taught that people who lack true and testing, doubting the primal vow, are born in the borderland, where they atone for evil karma and ultimately attain enlightenment in the land of fulfillment. Since true and trusting is very rare, many people go to the temporary land. And yet to contend that they are ultimately hopeless is to accuse the Buddha of falsehood. Okay. All right, so let me show you that one. Okay. So wait, who, who's, who's the author of that? Translation, Translation series. Yeah. Right. Some people say that those who gain birth in the borderland will, in the end, fall into hell. In what testimonial passage do they find such a view? It is lamentable that this view is asserted by those who pretend to be scholars. How do they look upon the sutras and discourses? I have heard that those, follow, I've heard that those followers who lack faith will be born in the borderland due to their doubt in the original vow, and after having expiated their sins of doubting, they will attain enlightenment in the recompensed land. As followers of faith are few, many people are led to the transformed land. Therefore, to contend that they will end up in vain is so to blame the Tathagata for deceiving us. Okay, that's good. All right. 
And I have uh, uh, Dennis Hirota's translation here. Right. Um, chapter 17. Concerning the assertion that a person born into the borderland will in the end fall into hell, in what passage do we find such a statement? It is deplorable that this notion is being presented among people who pride themselves as scholars. How are they reading the sutras and treatises, the right teachings? I was taught that the practicer who fails to realize seeing being is born in the pure and the borderland because of his doubt concerning the primal vow. And after atoning there for the karmic evil of harboring doubt, he realizes enlightenment in the true fulfilled land. Since practicers who realize Jin Jin are few, many are led to the transformed land. To declare in spite of this that in the end they will all be useless is to pronounce Shakyamuni Buddha guilty of lies. Okay, so um, anyone want to make any comment before I start? Any particular view on this? You have another translation. Who's that? This is by uh, Toshikazu Arai. Oh, that's a new one, yeah. Why don't you read that one? Some persons say that those who are born in the borderland will eventually fall into hell. Show me a document that attests to that assertion. How lamentable it is that this was mentioned by persons who pride themselves in their learning. I wonder in what way they are reading the sutras, commentaries, and other sacred texts. I have heard from Master Shinran that in Lutsu practitioners who fail to completely entrust themselves to the primal vow are to be born in the borderland first because of their doubt about the vow and that they can attain enlightenment in fulfilled land after they have cleared themselves of that doubt. Because there are very few practitioners of the Nimbutsu with true faith, the Tathagata has prepared the transformed land to admit to those great many who have doubts. To say that those who are born in the transformed land will be eventually denied birth in the pure land is, therefore, tantamount to saying that the Tathagata has lied. Okay, uh, so for me there's a number of interesting things, even though this is, so this is obviously a heresy, okay? So what you notice in the Tanya Show, you've all been doing this for a while, that the first ten, the first half of the Tanya Show is full of interesting philosophical ideas. The second half is all about a list of heretical statements that have to be discounted. So um, in that sense, the first half is, in general, a lot more interesting discussion. But clearly, there's something, uh, each of the heresies has um, other implications that are worth thinking about. So obviously the idea that because you're born in the borderland you go to hell is con contradicts what's in the sutras. Um, so in that sense, what's going on? Well, we can assume therefore that there are um, there's a problem trying to control the rhetoric. Okay, we're living at a we're talking about a time in medieval Japan where communication between disparate communities around the country can't be controlled. People don't have a common educational background. Uh, a lot of stuff they hear, uh, they get from hearsay. Individual teachers come through and preach things in a way that people say, okay, and then they, this is the way they remember it. Um, and, you know, it's also, also worth remembering that, I don't know the degree to which this is relevant, but um, this material about the borderland, this is in the, the, the Pure Land Sutras, okay? It's in the larger sutra. The largest sutra is in Chinese. You've got to be able to read Buddhist Chinese, which is not an easy thing to do unless you're educated. Even for you guys, it's hard to read. Uh, so um, certainly it's quite possible that a lot of uh, Shin communities had nobody who could read sutra Chinese. Uh, I'm just guessing, but probably the, the language ability was limited for a lot of these people uh, who were not in the capital, who were out, particularly out in uh, rural areas. And so their understanding of what the teaching is based on, well, based on what they heard. And again, as these things get transmitted generation to generation, person to person, things change and ideas change. So clearly, um, so let's talk about what the, what the sutras actually say about the borderland, okay, what's called the translators of the borderland. This is in this, the larger sutra, and it's a punishment not for lack of faith, but for arrogance, okay? People who are arrogant and lazy are said to be born there. Now, you know, this, if you look at this in the context of, say, the nine grades of rebirth in the Pure Land and the Contemplation Sutra, 
This shows that, in fact, there was uh, a conception that, in fact, getting to the Pure Land was not a black or white deal. There are many ways to get to the Pure Land. Sort of like being admitted to the university, one of many different classes, okay? And, um, and how you got to the Pure Land, where you got to in the Pure Land, was based on what you did here, okay? And so this is something that um, I think is not as well appreciated, perhaps outside in the West. In any case, um, the nine grades of rebirth in the Pure Land that are in contemplation are a serious matter. And that why does it, the contemplation of goes in great detail about who gets born uh, at what grade and why? Okay, and, the, and this statement about being born in the Henji, the borderland, is something like that. So the larger sutra has a whole section after the vows have been discussed and confirmed about bad people and the mistakes they make, usually translated as evil. Okay, Aku. And, um, and this is one of the errors. Now, Interestingly, these people who are haughty, uh, these people who are lax or lazy in their practice get born on the hinterland, but they're still born in the pure land. They're just on the edge of it, okay? What that means is that they're... So the way it works uh, is that the different stages of rebirth, the different nine grades, etc., and this kind of thing all have to do with how far they are from the Buddha. Amitabha sitting you're born right in front of him, or you're born a mile away, or a hundred miles away, or a thousand miles away, or you're on the edge. Now the other thing is, uh, one of the descriptions of the people born in the hinterland is that they're born from a womb, okay, a womb birth. A womb birth is a big deal in the pure land because you're not supposed to be born that way. The proper rebirth is you just magically appear. So, this again suggests that maybe it's still a samsaric kind of thing. You're still in samsara because they haven't been born from a mother. Right? They have to go through fertility and this kind of thing and gestation. So it is an unclear un, uh, concept. My guess is that the sutras add this kind of thing because they want to encourage people, you know, to, to have faith and to be diligent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and therefore, they, they're holding out some kind of punishment for those who are not. Uh, and this, therefore, this problem in this chapter speaks to the whole issue of what's in the contemplation sutra for the ninth grade, the people on the bottom who've led terrible lives, who don't have faith, who just do whatever the hell they want, and commit crimes, etc., etc., and at the end, the sutra says, well, believe in these people, if they chant no longer to Butsu, they can still get to the pure land, right? If they have ten moments of faith, blah, 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 at the very end. And so, this is a kind of Conundrum. This is a paradox. This is a problem for Pure Land Buddhism as a whole, and that's why I think this. Even though this statement that they're going to be born in hell is not borne out by any scripture, and therefore is clearly rejected as inaccurate, reflects on this bigger problem. That's what I want to suggest to you about the fact that since Pure Land Buddhism is accepting of anyone, right? Therefore, um, this led to all sorts of hand-wringing, consternation. So on the one hand, uh, this you could say, well, this opinion that the people born in the, in the borderlands are going to hell is a way to reinforce the fact that we don't want people to be lazy and not have faith. We want them to have faith and lead a proper life, right? On the other hand, once you push that too far, then you say, well, that means not everybody gets into the pure land, then it's no longer a universal religious message, then it doesn't have the same appeal. So you got this kind of paradox here uh, that's problematic. Now, I want to add one more thing, and this is what Gordai Shigeru. This is an amazing book, by the way. I'll pass this around. Uh, so Gordai Shigeru is a uh, Higashi sort of anthropologist, okay, who wrote a lot on um, sort of unusual folk religion in Japan, okay. A lot of did a lot of good research on deathbed, funeral traditions, uh, and he talks about what's called Shodo. Shodo is um, Shodo is a kind of uh, It's a kind of performance preaching, okay, that goes back to Honen's time. 
So one of Honen's disciples, a contemporary of Shinran called Seikaku, Seikaku is a senpai of Shinran, a little older than him, Shinran quotes Seikaku's writings, um, and um, Seikaku and his father had a temple in the middle of Kyoto in which this is what they did. People came there, uh, and this went on for centuries, and this was like famous in Kyoto for a place to go for religious, you know, and say entertainment, Buddhist entertainment, you know? So it's something like, you know, medieval European, uh, performance where they can do all sorts of stuff. We don't really know exactly what they did. If they have plays, they have comedians. In any case, there was a lot of uh, preaching that was done in a kind of performance style. Very similar to today what we call Fushinan Sekyo, which um, we're trying to bring here, which goes on in Kyoto, it goes on in Japan, in which people come out and they start singing, okay, and then they tell jokes and then they you know start doing Shinshu preaching. So the Shoto tradition that um, that Gordai talks about in here, he says, what's strange about this passage is that it assumes that if you, there's no mention of going to the Pure Land and coming back, okay? What's called Genso Echo. Mm -hmm. You know, what's supposed to be going on is that you go to the Pure Land and your ultimate goal is not to attain Nirvana, but to come back here uh, and help others get to the Pure Land, right? And so, and then he says, he thinks that this kind of complaint, that people go there and then they just go to hell after that, comes from this kind of Shoto tradition where they have all sorts of fantastic, emotionally exciting stories, and uh, they never talk about returning. They only talk about going, okay? And so, um, I don't know, you know, I don't know where he gets this from, but he's reading all this stuff that I don't know where it is, what it is. He doesn't ref, he doesn't mention any any other source materials, but that's another way to look at this passage. Is it is only about it's only concerned with getting to the pure line, getting to the Buddha, and succeeding there. It should be concerned about going and coming back, right? So that's another another thing to talk about here. Yeah. Immediately, I'm thinking that this touches on the larger and more persistent issue. We're obviously talking about the Bodhisattva ideal. Right. But then it does occur to me that you want the the whole question of birth uh, in the pure land kind of moves center stage and the Bodhisattva idea can get pushed off to the side. Well that's what he's complaining about. In other words, why, why, why is the Tanisha talking about that, you know? <laughs> that should be front and center here. Um, and therefore he thinks that this, this passage is kind of reflective of a kind of, you might say, popular religion, right? Mm -hmm. So and that's part of the interesting aspect of Shinran. Shinran leaves the capital. Shinran is very high born, as you know. He then goes out and lives with farmers and fishermen and communicates on an old way that everybody or a lot of people can relate to and understand. Obviously, a very good communicator, um, and this therefore you know, results in Buddhism spreading, you know, out in in rural areas, um, without perhaps professionally trained leaders to guide it, and so you have various kinds of interpretations. Um, and so maybe this aspect of coming back from the pure land sort of got falls off, you know, or at least. Um, that maybe is kind of uh, too much of an idealistic thing. Um, I, you know, we, we recently, uh, there's a new book uh, on Japanese Buddhism called Right Thought at the Last Moment by Jackie Stone. We just gave her the Berkeley Buddhist Studies Prize last week. And um, this is about deathbed nimbutsu, okay? And uh, I gave a talk about this. Uh, we had three people who spoke about the book. And um, one of the things I noticed in preparing my talk and so this is sort of a little bit off subject, but maybe not. Anyway, <laughs> Shinran and Honen are very interesting. You know, Honen, when you look at the life of Honen, and at that time in Japan, everybody thinks if you don't die chanting the Nembutsu in meditation, you're, going to, you're not going to get, you're going to have a bad rebirth. <laughs> it's very strong belief that what happens at the end of your life has much greater karmic meaning than what happens prior to that. It's a, like, heightened moment, you know? Sort of like suddenly you're on stage, you're on TV, just the time to say your thing, you know. And so um, many people thought this is a way to get to the pure land without necessarily living a life of faith or living a religiously pure life. Same kind of thing. I can sort of do what I want, but if I have a good death experience, I can succeed. And 
Honan really doesn't like this. And, but Honan is the Pure Land guy, right? He, Honan, is such a, Honan is a major celebrity in the capital at the time. Compared to Shinran, who's never mentioned in anybody's writing, Honan is mentioned in everybody's writing. Everybody likes or doesn't like Honan. He's, his name appears all over the place at that time. He's really a celebrity. And so what Honan says really has an impact. Everybody listens, and they're going to support him or they're going to deny him. And uh, it's a very he's a very public person in that way. And Honan takes a very strong stance against this belief in this deathbed Nembutsu ritual. Uh, and says, you should not feel that you're going to achieve rebirth in the Pure because of what you do at the last moment of your life. You should be doing this long before the last moment of your life. And all this should be confirmed far earlier, should be confirmed when you're healthy and happy and you can concentrate and do proper practice, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Shinran, similarly, uh, it's in the Tani Show, by the way. I think it's chapter 14. Shinran also makes a disparaging remark about this deathbed nimbutsu ritual as being ridiculous. Okay, it's not as being beside the point. Um, I think Shinran complains about it as kind of a jidiki, self power thing. Um, and it, uh, what Honen says is, what's supposed to happen is it's called shonen. Shonen is proper thought, proper nimbutsu, right? You should have the um, how do I see, right? Mm -hmm. Should have the proper uh, state of mind at the moment as you're dying, right? And if you can achieve this, then boom, the Buddha will, you know, Buddha will definitely appear. It would be great because that's what the Buddha is asking you to do. Uh, and this, you know, is based in some degree on the sutra saying, you know, when you die, you die thinking of the Buddha. The Buddha appears and takes you to the Pure Land, you see all these beautiful paintings about this kind of thing, the Rango paintings. And what Honen says is people think that if they can produce the Shonen, therefore the, the Buddha will come, when in fact the truth is they, produce the, they can produce the Shonen precisely because the Buddha's already here. Okay? Without the Buddha, you're not going to get that Shonen, right? That's what Honen's position is. And if you understand that, you know that the power comes from the Buddha, not from your own head, right? But the Buddha's sort of waiting, you know, because right there, it's like behind the door, that kind of thing. So, um, but what I realized when I prepared my talk was that Honen says this, Shinran says this. Okay, these are very influential people, right? Everyone thinks of them as saints or reincarnations of the Buddha or whatever. What happens? Does that mean that this deathbed Nembutsu belief disappears? Not at all. I found an 18th century text in which it's called the Chamise Mondo, two women sitting in a tea house in the middle of the 18th century in Japan. And one of them says, the younger woman, it's a younger woman and an older woman, the younger woman says the older woman, everybody believes that if you don't have the Nembutsu in the Shonen when you die, you can't go to the Pure Land. Is that true? This is 18th century, 800 years, you know, 700 years later. So in other words, this stuff doesn't disappear. It doesn't disappear in the, pure, in the Jodo sect, it doesn't disappear in the Shin sect, it still goes on, it still goes on into the 20th century. And so what you see is Honen and Shinran, these great heroes who supposedly bring Buddhism to the masses, when it comes to this kind of thing, they're not the masses, they're the saints. In other words, people are saying, well, Honen and Shinran don't have to worry about what's in their head when they die, but we do. We're not Honen and Shinran, you know, how can we do this, you know? It's a funny kind of paradox, right? Now, those people who are supposedly you know, responsible for giving Buddhism to the world are, in fact, not ordinary people at all. Even though Honen and Shinran repeatedly say, I'm an ordinary person, I'm, an ordinary, I'm just a regular guy, I'm not a saint, right? But in fact, at this point, they were regarded that way. So, these things can go on. These popular religious beliefs, like if you're born on the edge of the borderland and pure land, you're not going to get into the pure land, where these things come from, who knows, but once they get into the culture, it's very, very hard to get rid of them. And is that part of then what you would say is part of the status quo then? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so, so the question is, this belief that if you're born in the borderland, you go to hell, to what degree is that the status quo? I don't know. I mean, outside of the Tanisho mention, I never heard this before. What the sutras say is if you're born in the borderland, you have to wait 500 years to get to see the Buddha. Okay? Now, it doesn't say you go to hell during that time. It just says you're sort of living out there in the world. Yeah. 
in the Sierras or something for 500 years. Which is not, we live for 500 years, not bad yet. Yeah. In, in the study of the Kyogo Shinsho that I've done, you know, Shinran is very clear about that, that it is not a penalty box in the sense that you're meant to get out of it. Right. It's, just, it's a delay situation. Right. So, you know, the essence of, as I've always felt it to be, is that, that come on, get Get straight, get straight, because you know you'll get there eventually. But why drag things out? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's so. Like I say, that's this to me. This is part of the nine grades thing. It's the same. It's the same concept, basically. That there are different levels of proximity to the book club. You're simply talking about when you get access, and the closer you are, the sooner you get access, the quicker you you attain liberation. I mean, that's really. What it's about. So, um, why this came about, you know, who knows? And the degree to which it was present, I don't know. Um, so, that's really all I have to say about this. Does anyone have any other questions about this section? All right, so let's do 18 next. Go ahead, you read 18. Some people say that the amount of offerings made to the, the Dharma will determine the size, great or small, that we will become as Buddhas. First of all, is it possible to determine the size of Buddha, whether great or small? Even though the size of Buddha in the Pure Land is described in the Sutra, it is the manifestation of Dharmakaya as compassion, appearing for the sake of human beings. When one attains supreme enlightenment and realizes Dharmakaya as it is, how can size be discussed, since such shapes as long or short, square or round, do not exist, and color is also transcendent, whether it be blue, yellow, red, white, or black? Some say that they see the transformed Buddha when uttering the Nembutsu. Could they have based their view on such statements as the following and applied it here? In loud utterance, one sees a huge Buddha, and in quiet utterance, one sees a small Buddha. Furthermore, although offerings can be part of the practice of selfless giving, no matter how many values we present to the Buddha or give to our teachers, the act is meaningless if true entrusting is absent. If one is made to give the self up to other power and true entrusting is complete, even though one does not present even a single sheet of paper or even half a coin to the Buddha Dharma, he or she is in accord with the intention of the primal vow. Are people intimating their fellow practitioners using the teaching as a pretext to fulfill their own selfish needs? Okay, so he's very unhappy about this one, too. <laughs> uh, you know, this is obvious, again, a kind of obvious mistake, so I don't... Um, so, where, where does this idea come from? Let me ask you. What, is, what, what do you think? What is the basis of this notion that you, the size you're offering makes a difference? So you, should, yeah, go ahead. Is that a hand? You, oh. you click your pen. Your right. hand sort of move, you know. <laughs> I was doing off the cue there. Okay. Well, I'm wondering if it has something in the way to do, you know, the way we define offering. Um, okay. The, the thought that popped into my head was like you know some people say well you got to come to church you gotta you gotta practice harder and if you do that you're you're more in a way than pure land versus those who maybe only come occasionally but they still feel within their heart that they're saved by Anita you know that the two are actually equal but maybe some people are saying like no you come to church more you're you you're more on your way versus those who don't come I don't know if that makes sense but that's a thought no it's an interesting yeah. point and and um, the first thing I thought of when you said that is that. Um, in Japan, they don't have regular Sunday services. People don't go to church every week. Nobody goes. Nobody feels the need to go to church. This is an American phenomenon, and yet people, you know, assume that this has value, right? Because that that's sort of the norm in our culture. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, spiritual materialism. I'd say you know, you're making your down payment. Making a down payment. <laughs> you're investing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the, the thing that comes to my mind when I read that is Jim Baker. Jim Baker. Yeah, okay. the, the, the whole so, I'm not idea. sure what the young people know what Jim Baker is. <laughs> the whole idea of evangelical preachers on television right. getting rich uh, from telling poor people that they can make them healthy. You know, it wouldn't have surprised me a bit if something similar like that went on in Japan. Uh, 
I know it went on all over Europe. It, it's not a phenomenon of, of 20th century U.S. It, the Catholic Church across Europe did an awful lot of that kind of stuff. The, the sales of absolutions have been an absolute constant throughout every religious body everywhere, and sure. we see a lot of that coming out of China prior to the writing of the Money Show, and I'm sure that you know, it's in India too. Yeah, I mean, th this is. You know. So the way, so what I suggest in terms of how you can talk about this in your communities is to talk about merit. Okay, mm -hmm. you know the Buddhist concept of merit we don't really have in Western religion, although the process is the same. It's just it's it's, a, it's kind of a rationalized, a very smart rational rationalized notion. And merit you can define as spiritual capital. Mm -hmm. That is, you create spiritual power, and because it's a form of capital, you can use it for whatever you want. You can purchase things with it. You can, uh, the initial, and the, the Pure Land Sutras are very clear about the fact that you apply your spiritual capital, your merit, to the goal of rebirth in the Pure Land. Uh, and you give it to other people as well. And so, um, that is totally orthodox. There's nothing odd about that. Um, and what what Honen, what Shandao starts to, you know, Pure Land Buddhism starts to go in another direction, but it never totally discounts that. That's always part of it. And, you know, from Shandao to Honen to Shinran, there's this notion that, yes, you have a certain degree of merit, but, but what Shandao wants you to remember is that even as an ordinary person, your merit will never be sufficient alone to get you into the Pure Land. That's why you have to rely on the Buddha's power to intercede. The Buddha has, but if you talk, if you look at the sutras and say, how can the Buddha do this? The description is because he has infinite merit, okay? It's still merit. In other words, merit is power, okay, in Buddhist thinking. And it's spiritual power. And it therefore can be applied to anything you want. And if you want to apply it to making money, you can't, okay? Uh, so it's, you know, in some sense, it's, this is also connected to the notion of concentration. Uh, and this is something that's often lost, I think, in American Pure Land culture, is that uh, one constant throughout all forms of Buddhism is the power of concentration. The power of concentration works like merit. The more concentration you have, the more you can do, right? And as your concentration gets deeper and stronger, you can do amazing things. And it works just like merit, okay? And you can have a vision. You can attain samadhi and have a vision of Amitabha, and when that happens, you're, that confirms, that's what's called shojoju, your rebirth in the Pure Land is confirmed because you've had that religious experience. Religious experience comes from concentration, okay, and faith, and, you know, doing, and not in Nembutsu with the three states of mind. You look at the way the Nembutsu is described in the sutras, in the larger sutra, in the contemplation sutra as well, you have to have a certain state of mind while you're doing it in order for it to have power. Why? Again, because the concentration aspects of it increases, um, sort of like, I don't know, ramps up the whole energy level so that more occurs, more energy occurs, right? So this is somewhat consistent. So the fact that people can then talk about merit in kind of a materialistic way like this, uh, this kind of heresy happens all the time. And so it's a constant potential problem. Any other uh, ideas here? Don't hesitate. Well, yeah, the problem exists in many different religious traditions, and I would venture to say in each tradition there are always people who will criticize it. They will maintain another standard that basically says it's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, again, this is this is just a, you know, spiritual materialism, Chogyan and Trump, that's a great book I highly recommend it if you don't know that book. Cutting through, I think it's called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, something like that. It's a really, really good book, yeah. Um, Trumpa, T R U M P A. He was a, well, the, one, maybe the first Tibetan teacher in America, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. I saw him speak, he came out with a glass of wine in his hand. He <laughs> <laughs> was great. So he immediately comes out with a glass of wine, and what does he do? He smashes, right, your expectation of what the Tibetan wow. Buddhist look like. And that was his way of cutting through spiritual materialism, right? You expect the great teacher to be a certain way, you know. So I do that by swearing at my students. <laughs> <laughs> you had your hand up? Well, 
just kind of what George is saying. It, it brings to mind some lessons I learned as a young Catholic boy growing up about the parable of the rich person giving a bunch of money to the synagogue and then the woman who had like two small little coins and who was more valuable than the other and then also the it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven kind of thing. So it's what well, happened to that in American society. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting that Protest, that, that last bit about, you know, rich people having a harder time getting into heaven. One thing that Protestant culture brought was a total denial of that, right? Yeah. yeah. That, in fact, you're expected to be successful if you're really going to get into heaven. Yeah. And you should be materially successful. And if you're not, that's a sign of failure, you know. So that's where Catholic culture and Protestant culture really, really diverge. And, um, and what can you do? On the other hand, the Catholic churches are very wealthy at times, and so they also garnered a lot of money, yeah. And Protestant tradition has churches that are not adorned at all. Right. You can't, you can't buy anything because there's nothing there. Okay. But there's a lot of money in the bank. There can be a lot of money. Okay. Um, also, it's an interesting reference in here to... Uh, Seeing a Buddha when said loudly, I think they're referring to Lao Nembutsu. Uh, Lao Nembutsu is something that uh, occurs in China. This idea is, starts after Shandao, the second half of the Tang Dynasty. Huai Gong Ekan is a student of Shandao. Uh, some people consider him, I don't know, a student, but some people consider him a reincarnation of Shandao. And he believed that you should say the Nembutsu loudly, and that this um, makes, increases your concentration. So it's, it's an interesting notion. So one of the things that, um, so I'm also doing a study of Nembutsu in one of my many projects. I'm also translating Shandao's commentary on the Contemplation Sutra. And um, what makes Nembutsu such an amazing concept is that Nen, this character, means mindfulness, right? It means both, so again, concentration, it also means recitation. And in the beginning, uh, the, the term nembutsu in Chinese doesn't translate recitation, it translates mindfulness of the Buddha. Recalling the Buddha, holding the Buddha in mind, thinking of the qualities and the virtues of the Buddha, and holding that in mind. It's a visualization exercise. This is very, very early uh, in the Maya tradition. That's Buddha Anusmurti, is a Sanskrit, and the Chinese really, really, this is translated already in the second century uh, AD in China, very, very among the earliest translations. Buddhist sutras is this kind of practice, this text with this kind of practice, and so this goes on and on. But at some point, the recitation part comes in, and they seem to be different, but I think what's really happening is that the, recit the using the voice helps the concentration, right? Mm -hmm. So in Sanskrit, um, the word is smirti or samadha, and um, I found something in the Lotus Sutra that reinforces the word meaning both recitation and mindfulness uh, in the that's a, never mind, you don't have to, we don't have to go into that, but in any case, um, that is part of what this is about, and so I think this idea of saying the Nimutsu loudly, you still see this in some Chinese temples, uh, and it's a way to get your attention, got it? In other words, so this is a very important part of Nimutsu, Nimutsu with a focused mind or an unfocused mind, that's part of the paradox of this whole thing, so Shan Dao says you don't have to have focused Nimutsu for it to work, but in fact, everybody wants to do focus Nembutsu. And if you look at Shandao's Contemplation Sutra commentary, he spends a huge amount of time going into great detail about each of the contemplations. So even though in the end of the book he says it's okay if you can't do this, you can still have Nembutsu that can be effective. In fact, he clearly favors the rest of the focus one. What is that? Is that a bell or something? Yeah, no. Oh, it's just a phone. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so that I just thought I'd add that so you, you you know what that reference is to. Shinran obviously knew about this too. Honan knew about this stuff. They all knew about all these. They all read all these pure land thinkers in China. And so, um, I don't know of loud nimbutsu practice in Japan. I never heard of it going on. But you know, there's also something called dai nimbutsu. Dai Nembutsu No, no. Well, Dai Nembutsu is from Dai Nembutsu. It's a kind of ritual. Right. Okay. 
Dainembutsu is um, is a kind of festival, okay? And uh, it's still happening in Kyoto. Uh, there's two or three places that still do this, in which we have theatrical performances, dancing, uh, various kinds of things. They're all part. They're all part of Nembutsu. Um, and this was um, very popular at this time. Also, still goes on today to some degree. And Dainembutsu Ji is one of the temples that does this kind of thing or did this kind of. I don't know if they still do it, but um, and so that's. Part of the fact that there's a kind of theatrical, what's the word, performative side mm -hmm. to Nembutsu, that uh, you can use it for dancing and singing and theater and painting and lots of things. And um, we don't have that in the West, <laughs> unfortunately. You guys should all do that, you know. So, uh, so this book I'm trying to finish on Nembutsu, I want to sort of introduce this and show pictures of things, and so. Um, you know, I have video and stuff of all the kind of things that are still going on in Japan. This earthquake in Fukushima was really, five years ago, was terrible because that was one of the best places in Japan for temples of performance. Mm -hmm. And most of those temples were destroyed. Mm -hmm. So um, probably that means that that tradition's gone in that area. You know, these kinds of performance traditions are local, based in a particular culture around a particular temple that go on for generation after generation. So when you go, when you become the abbot of that temple, that's one of the things you learn is that part of what we do is this, right? Uh, and so you, you, you know, you in, indulge in this, you devote time to this, and you make sure that people transmit that to the next generation, and that goes on. Um, so if the temple's gone, then that, that, unless the people outside the temple somehow have the energy to somehow keep it going, it's gone. This old culture, you know, it's very hard to hold on to it. Very hard to hold on to it. You know, I just really, really respect the people in Japan who are able to do that. Um, it's not easy. It was interesting. We had a conversation yesterday. Somebody said that the temples in Hawaii were concerned because they're losing a lot of the young members to the evangelical Christian churches. And so we were having a conversation about why. And so I wondered, perhaps, if some of you know the the mega churches are very. It's like entertainment almost. Exactly. There's this energy. So, so this show thing I'm talking about, the dining was in these. That's what that was. It's entertainment. Yeah. There was a lot of entertainment in Japan. It's still happening in Japan, but it doesn't happen here. You know, some people try. I know in Orange County they're trying. You know, they have music and things. But it really, it really takes. You know. It really takes people investing in this, right, who, who want to, and it takes creative people. So, um, we're sort of out of time, but, you know, this Fushidan Sekyo thing, I'll give a big speech about that in our after, the session after lunch, but, uh, uh, you know, we have to f encourage performers, I mean, we, you, have to encourage <laughs> performers, people who like to get up on stage and do stuff, you got to find a way for them to do it, you know? Uh, and. You know, that takes, a, again, a real investment of talent and support and whatever. And it can be done, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't need snakes, necessarily. <laughs> 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 uh, have you ever been to the uh, at a mega church? Uh -huh. With the rock band and the uh, videos and, and uh, you mm -hmm. know. It's fun. <laughs> I mean, it really is a performance. Uh, we have one of <laughs> that draws a lot of people. Yeah. Now, Bonadori is something that could be expanded yeah. beyond the traditional way of doing it. In other words, you can use the Bonadori as the occasion for other stuff. That's what I suggest, you know. That's the that's the obvious way to do it, right? Isn't that have... what they do in Brazil? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. I was thinking about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Temple of Sao Paulo basically is keeping it, it's re invented itself as a place to gather and dance. Yeah, yeah. Smart. Yeah. Smart. That's what they did in Kyoto. You know that picture of Eat Ben? You guys know that picture? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll show that picture later. You know, I mean, this is exactly what it was in Kyoto and around 1250. You know, people are getting together and dancing. You know, and they call it Nembutsu dance. Okay, Nembutsu Odori. So um, that's, there's a long tradition of that. It doesn't, you don't have to be Brazilian to <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> Okay, one final point about this last thing is uh, you can also see a subtle self-power, other power kind of tension here that by doing 
By indulging in merit making, you think that that's going to give you, in other words, this is also something that Shinran's not going to like, right? You know, when Shinran is very clear about the fact that there's the self power approach to all Buddhist practice is, is destined to fail. It's, it's, not, it's not the wrong thing to do, it's not detrimental. It's only detrimental if you believe that it has the greater power than what the Buddha can do. And so, it, so Honen and Shinran talk about this a little bit differently, even though I think their perspective is basically the same. What Honen says is it's just a bad choice, you know, in the sense that it's not going to work. It's not efficacious. Shinran says, you know, it's self-deluding, right? And you you make it harder for yourself. Honen would just say, you have a choice. Go down the self-power path or go down the other power path. You can do the self-power path, but your chance of success is very, very low. So it's like, I advise you, as your advisor, to take this class, not that class. That kind of thing. And Shinran says, look, man, forget the self-power thing. I'm a failure at it. Don't talk to me about that. I have nothing to say. This is all I can do. This is all I know. And so you look at Shinran, you're sort of impressed by his, his commitment, right, his conviction, you know. You know, he's truly confident that this is what works for him. And that's why he, that's what, another reason that China Joe is wonderful, because he says, I'm not telling you you should do this. I'm just telling you this works for me really, really well. And so then you take him as an example. But Shinran, on his side, is taking Honen as an example. He's doing the same thing. This constant, repeated reference to Honen. I'm just following Honen. Honen is my example. I'm just following him. And so, <laughs> from Shinran's perspective, Honen is, they say, Tara shito de wa nai in Japanese. He's not just a regular person. He's not just a person, you know, for Shinran. Honen has got some exalted status. And then after Shinran dies, Shinran's people look at Shinran and say, yeah, he's not just a person, right? He's got some exalted, same kind of thing. And Honen says, oh, Shan Dao, he's not just a person. He's got some, you know, same kind of thing. So uh, you can see how this, how this goes. Uh, and this plays out in sectarian consciousness. Also, uh, Honen clearly did not intend to create a new sect. Shinran clearly did not intend to create a new sect. But the people after them said, well, wait a minute. This is like a different person. This is a whole new thing. You know, we got to respect this. We have a, we, you know, in other words, they defined their lineage by their teacher, right? And we, we're not going beyond this, you know? So, and that's why people thought about Honen. And then after Shinran, the Shinran people said, oh, yeah, we define our lineage, our relationship, our, our karma connection to Buddhism through Shinran. Therefore, he represents a kind of community. And that's how you have a sect, okay? That's how these things start. Um, and so that's also fascinating because, you know, it shows, just like the Tanner Show being the, the result of people recognizing it for having power beyond what the Tanner Show says about itself, right? Um, and therefore, you know, the Tanner Show says, this is just what I heard Shinran say, but people say, well, but it sure looks like Shinran, you know, so, uh, kind of stuff.